Thanks very much, Charlie. And, uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, so welcome to our fibromyalgia uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Dave Cox, and uh, I work for Arthritis New Zealand. And um, yeah, we're just going to be looking at fibromyalgia, uh, a particularly different uh, subject to, to try and cover, but we'll, we'll certainly do our best to do that. And um, yeah, hopefully you can see that there's a Q&A uh, button where you can post any questions, and there's also a chat button you can actually um, put any comments there as well. So any technical issues, please please um, put, um, let us know by putting something in the chat box. So I'll, I'll make a start with the, uh, the presentation. So um, hopefully you can see the slide I'm looking at there. It's, this, is, um, this presentation has been um, uh, endorsed by the um, Royal College, uh, at Royal New Zealand College of GPs. So if there are any um, GPs or health practitioners out there uh, you can get some CPD uh, accreditation for this um, this, web this webinar. But I'm guessing that most people out there looking at this will be members of the general public. I'm sure some of you out there will ha actually have fibromyalgia, so I'm guessing that's why you've um, joined the, the webinar to find out a little bit more. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, uh, Dr. Ross Failing. She was the, um, the the clinician I approached to to have some clinical oversight over this. Um, uh, Ross Valen, she's actually, um, I think she's a GP in Howick, and uh, she's also written a book on um, chronic fatigue syndrome and, and uh, ME. Uh, so she is quite expert in this field, and she's had clinical oversight over this, um, this presentation. So I do thank her for that. I also thank my colleague, Emily Keel, who you've just heard, and she's been providing technical support for this webinar. So. Um, yeah, thank you, Emily, and she hopefully will guide us through any glitches which, which might happen during this presentation. Um, so this is what we're going to be looking at. Um, first of all, an understanding of fibromyalgia and its impact. A little bit of a look at the diagnostic criteria for any clinicians out there, and an understanding of the ULAR 2016 recommendations around the treatment of fibromyalgia. These are the most up-to-date um, recommendations I could find. So um, we'll be certainly looking at those um, in, in some detail. And then some other management options. Um, the ULAR recommendations don't cover some of the treatments out there. And then finally, uh, look, at, look at what Arthritis New Zealand can do for people who are, are affected by fibromyalgia. So, um, fibromyalgia, yeah. What what is it? It's uh, it's well, one of the one of the um, definitions is a chronic pain disorder. I think it's pretty poorly understood generally. Um, the, the cause is really unknown, although there are some theories around what what may cause it, and there's a possible genetic predisposition. Um, there's one of the um, thoughts is it may be possible abnormalities in the stress system or possible abnormalities in the hypothalamic pituitary axis and some possible triggering events. Now, the hypothalamic pituitary axis is quite a complex sort of interrelation between the, um, the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain, and the pituitary gland, which sits just underneath it, and the adrenal gland. So um, th there's some suggestion that um, there's something in, that, in that the way that they um, interact with each other. There are some, um, you may call this, you may hear this condition being called other things like um, fibromyalgia syndrome or fibrositis, which is I think quite an old term for this condition, but I still hear that, um, that term being used from time to time, or some people abbreviate it to FM. So looking at um, fibromyalgia, we think it affects about 2% of the population. Um, you'll see that there are some uh, numbers alongside some of these statements. These are references which um, will appear at the end. So if you want to know uh, where this information's come from, then the references will, will come up at the end. Um, often a delayed diagnosis, um, usually over two years now. This is, um, I'm sure a lot of you will, 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 can relate to this. I, I think I read somewhere the average time for di diagnosis is five years. And if that's true, then it would mean that to be an average of five years, and there are probably lots of people out there who have a much longer delay. Um, and I certainly have spoken to clients who's taken 10, 10, getting on for 10 years to get a diagnosis. Um, pain is a dominant feature. Um, 
that's usually one of the common features of fibromyalgia can have lots and lots of symptoms but pain is usually one of them and also the fatigue um, those seem, seem to be the main features of fibromyalgia um, a lot of people say that they they don't feel um, refreshed when when they do sleep uh, and, and sleep uh, some of you can get disturbances and cognitive impairment and a lot of people describe that as fibro fog and where they can't really um, concentrate very well um, so that that can have um, huge implications for people so looking at the pathophysiology well it's not really understood I don't think not 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 not, um, not that well uh, but there are certain uh, hypotheses around uh, one is uh, peripheral and central hyper excitability at the spinal or brain stem level um, it's almost like the nervous system is wound up and um, altered pain perception somatization now what somatization means for those who don't know is um, where psychological distress if you like can cause physical symptoms and um, so that's one of the theories um, and the nociceptive Stress. So, the nociceptive system is your is your sort of pain mechanism. So, um, all those um, nerve endings out there, which will pass on these pain messages, and uh, th there's links with stress regulation uh, and immune and sleep systems, and that, that can explain perhaps some of the clinical features around um, fibromyalgia. So, we do know all these things seem to be inter interrelated, and it certainly seems to be a genetic and environmental factor um, at play because it seems to be as more common in relatives of affected patients and that's not always blood relatives so there probably is some environmental factor as long along with genetic factors going on but it's not very well understood so um, if someone presented to a a, a, um, a doctor with, with any of these issues and um, these, these are some of the things that people sometimes report and to, to when they do see a doctor, and that is pain at multiple sites, um, pain with or without radiation to the buttocks and legs, and pain in the neck and across the shoulders. And sometimes people would describe it as pain all over. And I know a lot of the, the clients I see say that the pain tends to move around. It's not always in the same place. Um, and I think the pain seems to be there to some degree all the time. So unlike some other forms of arthritis where sometimes the pain can, can, um, can go away for a while and then, you know, it tends to flare and come and die away with fibromyalgia. It seems that pain is there to some degree all the time. And obviously sometimes worse than others, but a, a lot of my clients say that they're never really free of pain. Um, fatigue is, is a this. And um, sleep disturbance, which obviously makes the fatigue worse. If you're not having a good night's sleep, then you'll certainly feel a lot more fatigued the next day. Uh, so the sleep disturbances, you know, can make all the other symptoms worse and can and can contribute to depression. And, yeah, de uh, poor sleep can be a symptom of depression. So it seems like a, this catch-22 sort of um, situation where one thing is causing the other. Morning stiffness can be there for some people. Uh, and paresthesia, so um, this is like tingling or numbness um, that some people will, will report. Other things are feeling that the joints are swollen, even though the, when they're, the joints are actually examined, there's, there doesn't seem to be any swelling there, but they certainly feel swollen. Um, problems with cognition, so I mentioned that before, um, memory disturbance, difficulty with finding words, that sort of thing. Um, headaches and some people do experience migraines as well lightheadedness or dizziness fluctuations in weight anxiety and depression a lot of people report that the symptoms are worse in cold or humid weather and certainly under times of stress so I'm sure this isn't new for a lot of you people out there who, who have actually actually got these symptoms um, very hard to diagnose this, this uh, and that is you know probably why there's such a, a, a delay in diagnosis often um, that it is a difficult condition to diagnose um, a lot of those symptoms that we, we we talked about can be caused by other things so sometimes it's what's called a, um, a diagnosis of 
exclusion. exclusion. So basically, the, the, sometimes the doctor will have to exclude any other possible causes for those, um, those symptoms. And, um, and a lot of the time, people will have many, many tests to try and find out if there's anything else causing those symptoms. So, um, yeah, the American College of Rheumatology um, tried to put some classification criteria together, and they include widespread pain involving both sides of the body above and below the waist as well as the um, central skeleton for at least three months so it's chronic pain we're talking about here and the presence of 11 tender points and uh, i've got a diagram coming up which shows you where those tender points are they're in nine nine pairs um, so there's 18 of them all together uh, so the criteria say if you've got 11 of those or more uh, those tender points um, which which are, are uncomfortable when they're pressed then then that's one of the, the signs it may be um, fibromyalgia now it's not a very not a very good test because everybody will do that test slightly differently I guess is that when and the 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 the, um, the points should be pressed using the thumb and enough pressure should be um, put on the thumb to actually um, uh, idea that people are pressing hard enough in order to, to um, examine those tender points and usually there's some blood testing to exclude any other um, possible diagnoses as I mentioned before but you know it, it's probably not useful to, to, to um, over investigate you know all investigations have got the risks so um, you know you wouldn't want to over investigate these are the tender points that um, we, we, we talked about so there's um, yeah uh, so if someone suspected you had fibromyalgia, then a clinician should really be checking those tender points and um, as, as part of the, the examination. So moving on to those ULAR recommendations now, these are the uh, most up-to-date guidelines I could find on, on managing um, fibromyalgia. Once you have got a diagnosis, that would be quite tricky if people have got a diagnosis then you know what what can you do about it that's that's probably more uh, yeah that's an important part of it so ULAR stands for the um, European League Against Rheumatism and it's um, basically their the focus is on um, uh, rheumatology um, but a lot of people with uh, fibromyalgia do it do end up seeing a rheumatologist because sometimes the GP is not quite sure what's going on and might refer people to see a rheumatologist to, to get their expert opinion and I know a lot of my clients have actually got their diagnosis from seeing a rheumatologist but I find that really when they do see a rheumatologist then the treatment doesn't really change from uh, what the GP would be doing if you if they diagnosed it so uh, I'd be very surprised if a rheumatologist would want to keep seeing somebody with fibromyalgia as they had some other condition um, which they would be looking after as well so these are the guidelines and um, so I thought I'd look at some of the things that they talk about in those guidelines around treatment and a lot of it is, is medical treatment you know prescription medicines as, as I'm sure you probably expect and it's just talks about what evidence there is around some of those things so uh, this is probably the most amitriptyline is probably the most commonly prescribed uh, medication for fibromyalgia and um, certainly a lot of my clients will say that they've seen a GP they told they've been told they've got fibromyalgia and they've been started started on amitriptyline now there is some evidence that, that it can improve pain and sleep and fatigue um, and I think one of the reasons it's given is it can help people to sleep and I think the theory behind that is if if you can at least get people a decent night's sleep then the their symptoms won't be as bad the following day. Um, the, one of the problems with, with um, tryptoline is it can dry you, and also it can make you feel really quite drowsy. So sometimes people are told to take it last thing at night, but um, I would say, you know, if, if, it's, if you're feeling that you're really drowsy the following morning, it might be best to take it a little bit earlier than that, probably in the early evening, providing you're not going to drive or operate machinery in the evening so that would be my advice to people who find that they're drowsy the following day um, so amitriptyline is probably the most commonly prescribed medication for fibromyalgia symptoms and, and for some other chronic pain um, conditions as well 
it's actually an antidepressant, but it's used in a lower dose for, for, for these sort of conditions. And then um, some of you may have some experience of using these, uh, gabapentin and, and Lyrica. They, these are drugs used in epilepsy, um, but they have been found to, um, to help with certain, certain kinds of pain, particularly um, chronic pain. So it's, I, I certainly have um, spoken to clients who have been on gabapentin and, and, and remain on gabapentin. Um, it's, it, like all medications, it has its um, possible benefits and possible um, side effects and downsides. So that applies to all medications. So, you know, if your GP is prescribing you something like this, then hopefully they'll talk to you about the, the expected benefits and what possible risks there are. Um, Lyrica or uh, pregabalin, which is on the left there, is um, I, I, I don't think I've ever spoken to a client who's, who's been on pregabalin. It's very, very expensive. That might be one of the reasons. It's I think it's unsubsidized, and I think I'm, if I remember rightly, I was told it's about two hundred dollars a month um, to be on pregabalin. Um, but I do know of other people who've been on it and um, it's been reported to me that um, those people have actually found that the cost is worthwhile because it does actually allow them to ca carry on working. Um, so these are anticonvulsants and can be, um, can be helpful for some people. Um, and you know, your GP can talk, talk to you about these and whether they, they'll be right for you. A lot of pain specialists use these medications. Um, and as I say, they're, they're, like all medications, they will work well for some people and it won't, they won't suit other people. Um, but they're certainly one of the things that people will be, um, well, doctors will try. Um, and then there's the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, which most people have already tried um, for themselves. You know, by the time they get to see the GP, a lot of these you can buy over the counter without a prescription. Uh, you know, either from a pharmacy or sometimes even a supermarket. Uh, and most people with fibromyalgia have usually tried um, various types of pain. They even get this often. And um, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are, are useful drugs. They, they have got you know, um, benefits and risks like everything um, and very useful in, um, in arthritis. So people with osteoarthritis and, and um, inflammatory arthritis usually find that um, these things can actually be with, with pain and inflammation um, but they have got some potentially serious side effects so so people need to be aware of that the, the problem with non steroidal anti-inflammatory is is they do very well for fibromyalgia pain I'm sure some of you already know that and, and probably found that out through experience so some people do get some benefit from them but for fibromyalgia unlike unlike arthritis then then they don't seem to be that helpful and that probably extends to steroids as well uh, and which are very powerful but, uh, um, my my information is that steroids are not particularly helpful either so that takes us on to some other drugs that are sometimes used and um, this is a drug called duloxetin um, which is used widely overseas to treat um, fibromyalgia and and sometimes arthritis as well but um, it doesn't seem to be used in New Zealand. I'm not sure why, whether there's some restrictions over the prescription prescribing of it, um, whether it's something that's off label, perhaps I'm not quite sure, but certainly is used um, overseas very widely uh, for this sort of pain. And, um, you know, a lot of the, the um, clinical trials you'll see, especially if they're overseas trials, they sometimes will, will talk about this. Uh, but as I say, it doesn't seem to be widely used in, um, in New Zealand. Um, so, but there is some evidence that it can actually help with pain and uh, help people to sleep as well. Um, but doesn't seem to work so well with the fatigue. Fluoxetine, this is another one. And these are generally drugs used to treat um, depression. Um, uh, so this uh, can have an effect on pain as well, but also no effect on, on fatigue. And, and, and as I say, I've, I've not met a client who's been prescribed either fluoxetine or uh, duloxetine for fibromyalgia. Tramadol, this is quite, um, um, quite a powerful painkiller. Um, and there is some evidence that um, this can be helpful for fibromyalgia pain. It's prescription only, 
Um, some people find it's helpful. Some people find it causes them some pretty unpleasant side effects. So, um, you know, it will be helpful for some people and not for others. And that patients really, um, but certainly is, is used um, in fibromyalgia pain. So then looking at some of the other things that you're out there, which are not necessarily medications, but um, um, the, um, the ULAR recommendations look at how much evidence there is to support these things. Um, um, and there is some evidence that um, some people find that acupuncture is helpful for pain. Um, and sometimes um, electric acupuncture can be useful as well. And um, if there are any adverse effects, they seem, seem to be short lived. So it can be useful, but I do know people who I've talked to who said that um, acupuncture has actually made their symptoms worse. So obviously not eat, but I also know people who said it has, has actually helped them. So it may be something that people might want to try. There are some physiotherapists out there who will offer acupuncture. Um, so, you know, if, if people wanted to try it, then it, it probably is, a, is worth a try. Um, and it, it, as I say, it doesn't help everybody. Um, but um, it's just one of the, the tools out there that people can use. Um, biofeedback. Um, this is where people sort of are hooked up to a monitor and they can actually change some of their, uh, their bodily sort of rhythms um, if they're aware of what they are. Um, this doesn't seem to um, to work for fatigue or sleep, but there is some evidence that it um, can improve pain. Um, capsaicin, um, Zostrix is one form of capsaicin. It's, um, you can get Zostrix without prescription, I think, from a pharmacist. Um, use osteoarthritis pain, and seems to be some evidence that it does work for that. Um, and there does seem to be some evidence according to the ULAR recommendations that it can work for fibromyalgia as well. Um, although the trials that have been done have been too small to report on any possible toxicity. Um, but I, I generally find that um, when I look at the evidence out there that things that you rub into your skin generally um, are safer options than some of the things that you take as tablets because um, at the end of the day, you can wash them off if it's causing you a problem or a rash or anything like that. So like any, any medication, there, there are risks and side effects with, with all these things. I know for, for arthritis, sometimes the advice is for people to try a cream or a gel before they start um, taking medication orally. So um, this may be the case with fibromyalgia as well. So that's something that people might want to try as Ostrix. And, and I would suggest that people talk to their pharmacist about that. Um, and you know, see if it's right for you. It's not going to be right for everybody. Um, you know, if you've got a skin condition, it's the right thing for you. Um, yeah, a lot of people will seek advice from um, um, the EU evidence is that we really haven't got enough data to say whether it's effective or not. Um, but you know. Uh, I know people who've, who've tried it and found it helpful, and also people who've tried it and found it not helpful. But you can say that virtually about any treatment. Um, so um, the thing is, these things can be expensive. So, and you know, if you went to see a chiropractor, they probably would want to see you on a repeated basis. So you can end up spending quite a lot of money um, with something which which you may find has not helped that much. So um, you know, but I would encourage people to to explore all the options out there because some people will find it helpful. Um, cognitive behavior therapy. Um, this is something that's usually delivered by a clinical psychologist. Um, and um, I really don't understand it very well, but my, my understanding of it is that it's to think about their, their symptoms and, and their condition. Uh, because the, we know that you know, the, the way you, 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 you think about your symptoms will actually change your symptoms to some degree. So it's trying to get people to try and think differently about the situation, to think more positively, really. Um, I suppose an example of that might be two people who had the sim similar symptoms and one person was thinking really negatively about it, thinking this is, you know, this is really a downward spiral of disability and pain. 
and somebody else who had the same symptoms was thinking actually you know i can actually do things about do something about this and actually manage it manage it positively and i can still be active so that second person will probably uh, have a much better outcome than the first person behavior therapy is a way to try and train people to think more like the second person and that doesn't come naturally to a lot of people that certainly doesn't come very naturally to me and some people have to be taught to, to, to actually think along those lines and and as I say a clinical psychologist would be the person who normally delivers cognitive behavior therapy there is evidence that it does improve and can reduce disability as well and it's sometimes a component of a um, if people are referred to a pain um, pain specialist service then um, sometimes this is this is a part of it you know it's not just about looking at drugs it's this is um something else that can be very helpful so there is evidence that cognitive behavior therapy can be can be helpful those of you who haven't tried it you may want to talk to your gp about that you know whether they can possibly refer you to somebody who can deliver that um exercise um the ular recommendations say that there's good evidence for improvement in pain and function um, but no real evidence to support one form of exercise over another form of exercise. So that I know that's one of the questions I've already received and I will answer, try and answer that question at the end. Uh, one of the questions I've received was about what form of exercise is, is, is better than others for fibromyalgia. And this is a very difficult one because I do know that talking to people with fibromyalgia, many of them find that some exercise is actually uncomfortable and actually exacerbates the pain. So obviously for those people then, you know, they probably need to explore some other forms of exercise. Um, but what we find is that if people can remain active, then that keeps the, you know, if, the, if people uh, become inactive, they lose muscle tone. And that makes it more likely they're going to become injured when they do exercise. And that can lead them into a spiral of, you know, uh, more pain and more disability. So we do try and encourage people to exercise. Um, but to find the right exercise for that particular person. And that may, might mean um, exploring different um, options out there. Um, hydrotherapy is one of those options. Um, there is good evidence that hydrotherapy helps with pain. And th that actually is maintained on the longer term, which is great. So there does seem to be evidence that um, hydrotherapy gives long-term um, can give long-term pain relief for some people so that that can be helpful um if people can access it now i know there are certain parts of the country where it's not easy to access those sort of things but if you are then we would probably encourage people to give that a try um and this, um leads me on to talk a little bit about the green prescription so if as when we're talking about exercise probably your experts out there are your physiotherapists so i would encourage people who are who who can afford to see a physiotherapist to perhaps give it a try physiotherapists can be very helpful as i say, said before some of them can offer things like massage and um, acupuncture as well but as, as far as giving you some appropriate exercise then a physiotherapist is probably the most expert person you can talk to uh, but sometimes there is a cost to that there, there, there are actually a physiotherapist public system but Generally, the wait is quite long. Um, and I think in reality, most people who see a physiotherapist um, pay privately to see one. And that can be quite expensive because um, they usually repeated sessions. So for those people who can't afford to see a physiotherapist, I would um, encourage people to find out a little bit more about the Green Prescription, which is a free program, um, which is a um, nationwide. It's a, it's a nationwide program. It's delivered by different organizations throughout the country. Um, I'm actually sending this webinar from Dunedin and um, I'm talking to you from, from Dunedin and here the green prescription is run through Sport Otago, um, but it, um, it'd be run through different providers through the program. There's a 0800 number there at the top of the screen, but you do need a referral to get onto the green prescription. You need a referral from um, a health practitioner. So either your GP or your practice nurse can refer you on to that green prescription because the guys who deliver that program do need to have a little bit of understanding about your general health. So if you had say breathing problems or heart condition, then they would need to know that um, when they're trying to put together an exercise program for you. 
but I would certainly encourage people to, to, to give that a try if, if people need some help with regard to exercise. Hypnotherapy. Um, I don't know anybody. None of my, I haven't spoken to a client who's tried this, so I, I haven't had any feedback. Um, according to the ULAR recommendations, there are con contradictory trials which show different th effects. Um, but you know, it's just one of those things that people would would try, I think, and, and I would certainly not discourage people from trying it if they can afford it. Um, it's just one of the, the options out there. But um, sometimes the the clinical evidence does not mean to say that um, you know something has got no clinical evidence to support it. Doesn't mean to say that it's not going to work for you. So um, you know, uh, clinical evidence is useful, but it's not sometimes the whole picture. You know, but some people will find that they do get a benefit from something that might not necessarily have a huge amount of clinical evidence to support the use of. Um, massage, I mentioned that before, a lot of physiotherapists can, can provide with massage. Uh, a lot of my clients actually report to me that massage has been very helpful, um, providing it's the right sort of massage. Um, some people say that you know it has to be quite light touch, and if people are going for the heavy massage, that can actually make things a lot worse. So. Um, but as far as evidence is concerned, um, then some of the some of the trials they weren't very particularly well designed, so we can't read too much into them. Um, but you know, the, what evidence is out there says that programs of five weeks or more more duration is is probably um, more helpful. But then again, there is to be a cost side to that, obviously. Meditative 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 movement. Um, so these are things like um, Tai Chi and yoga and uh, uh, Qigong, I think it's called. Um, these are all forms of meditative movement and um, there is some evidence to support the use of that and um, some evidence that actually um, supports that these can be um, long-term effects that people get from those. So we certainly would encourage people to, to try those if they haven't already. Mindfulness or mind-body therapy. Um, evidence there is an evidence of um, benefit there um, I think mo our modern society these days we, we can get our nervous systems can get a little bit overloaded with what's going on around us with or surrounded by you know, all these um, you know, mobile phones and, and technology and the like and sometimes it'd be quite hard to switch off uh, and just be trying to empty your mind of all that stuff um, but Certainly for people who can learn to practice mindfulness, it does seem to be helpful. And this is not a new thing. People have been doing this for centuries, but um, mindfulness, I think, is quite a new term. So I think the encouragement is for people to become more like that dog in the, in the picture there, who's just thinking about the walk, rather than like the person who's taking the dog for a walk, whose mind is full of all kinds of stuff um, about, you know, um, and, and I, I know I'm just as guilty about that, um, uh, about, uh, around those things as anybody else, you know, trying to think about, you know, what, what am I going to cook for tea tonight, you know, and not, not, so I think mindfulness is trying to get you to switch off, just try and clean, clear your mind of all the things that have happened in the past, which you may be dwelling on and trying to, you know, stop you from worrying about things in the future and just to try and be in the present moment and think about what's going on at the time. That's my understanding of it. Um, so there is some evidence that um, that, that can be helpful. Uh, Multi-component therapy, this is where um, various things are used. Um, so it can be a com combination of um, psychological um, support and exercise. So it's a combination of those things. And there is some evidence that that, that can be helpful as well. And then there are things you can get without a prescription. This is um, something called um, S adnosylomethione, and I can't say it, um, S-A-M-E, is um, it's something that people will, will sometimes hit up on, on the internet. Uh, as far as I know, you don't need a prescription for it, so you can just go and buy it either online or from a pharmacist or health food shop. But there's really not a lot of evidence to support the use of it. But as I say, that doesn't mean to say it's not going to work for some people. Um, and there are other complementary therapies out there which you may have tried already. Um, guided imagery that's uh, you know, where you sometimes uh, um, given some um, uh, sometimes a recording to listen to where you can imagine yourself in, um, in a pleasant situation uh, some of those things are available on YouTube 
Um, so there's some evidence that those things work. Homeopathy, well, we haven't really got enough evidence to say yes or no on that. The trials that have been done weren't particularly well designed. Um, electrothermal and phototherapeutic therapy, um, there's really not a lot of evidence to support the use of that as well. Phytothermotherapy, and I had to look that up, I'd never heard of it before, but that's uh, apparently a tree was originates from Italy, and uh, this is where they surround fermenting grass <laughs> um, or hay baths, I think they're called, where people are sort of immersed in, in fermenting grass, and it's probably been used for centuries, uh, but there's really not a lot of evidence to support the use of that, and I'm not sure whether you could probably get that treatment in New Zealand anyway, but this, this, these are all the, um, the things that people have tried. Music therapy and, and journaling and story, storytelling, um, these are things that people try. There's not a lot of evidence to support the use of that. Uh, magnet therapy, uh, not a lot of evidence to support the uh, transcranial magnetic uh, uh, and or direct current stimulation. There's not a lot, lot of evidence to support that either. And sometimes that has actually been um, the cause of um, quite um, for anything I would jump to first if I was trying to explore um, potential treatments. So those are, the, those are the things that the ULAR recommendations looked at. They looked at all those things and said how much evidence there was to support the use of, of them or not. There were some things that weren't covered in those ULAR guidelines and um, so these are things that people tell me have helped them. Um, but there really isn't a lot of evidence to support the use of them as far as I'm aware. But certainly anecdotally, people have told me that um, they found these things useful. So the first thing is magnesium. Uh, and probably people out there listening to this have tried it. What I've read online is that it actually works better if you combine it with something called malic acid. Uh, now, malic acid is found in apples, so you can actually um, get malic acid from eating apples. Um, so the old say an apple a day keeps the doctor away is probably probably sound advice for if you've got fibro um, available fibro fibro malic is one of the combinations out there which combines magnesium and malic acid but your pharmacist can talk to you about um any other different um different versions of that um, but some people might find that helpful no enzyme q10 some people have reported to me that that's been helpful as well and then ginkgo um, biloba extract. Um, these are all things that people have reported as, as being helpful. As I say, um, clinical evidence is not that strong, but sometimes that means that they just haven't looked at that. You know, that in order to get, um, excuse me, um, in order to get good clinical evidence, you need to do clinical trials, and sometimes those trials just haven't been done. So just because there's no clinical evidence doesn't mean to say it doesn't work. It may mean that the, the trials just haven't been done. Um, low dose naltrexone, some of you may be aware of this. Um, I know one client who's reported to me that this has made the biggest difference for her. Um, as far as I know, it's prescription only. Um, it's usually a drug used to treat um, alcohol and opioid addiction um so but it there are there, there is some evidence that used in low doses it may be helpful for some painful conditions so um yeah um so something you might want to talk to your gp about um as i say this lady um who spoke to me uh, said she really had to persuade the gp to, to to prescribe it but when when um, the gp did prescribe it she found it was very very helpful um so that's that's just one of the things out there um now we could probably spend all afternoon talking about this um this is um, medicinal cannabis <clears throat> a lot of the clients i speak to do report this has been very helpful um but um i'm sure you're aware of some of the issues around it it still remains an illicit um treatment at the moment although there is some um, progress being made through parliament but unfortunately i think at the moment it's just being considered for people with um with terminal illness i think which you know excludes a lot of people who may find it beneficial 
the clinical evidence isn't that strong, but as I say, that, that sometimes can mean that the clinical trials have just not been done, or, um, but there's certainly a lot of people who do report that this is helpful. Um, the, I think the, the biggest problem with this is the one that it's still not legal at the moment. Um, there, you, can get, you can get legally prescribed um, medicinal cannabis if you can get a GP to prescribe it for you. The problem with that is finding a GP who's willing to do that, uh, also the cost. I think the the um, the ones that are available in New Zealand at the moment are incredibly expensive. Um, so that that's one of the problems around that. So yeah, be interested to see what happens in this space. Um, yeah, um, certainly a lot of my clients will will resort to using this. And um, yeah, and uh, as I say, that the, they do report it's helpful. Diet, yeah, it'd be great if we could say there was something in your diet you could either take out or include, which would help your fibromyalgia symptoms. Um, there are plenty of an anecdotes out there about, um, I hear from people that are going onto a paleo diet or gluten-free diet or on an organic diet or reduced dairy or reduced starch. There are people who report that all of those things have helped those people, but that might be a, an individual thing, thing for that person. Um, it's very hard, you know, to know. I know people who have con contrary. So my advice would be if people did want to explore the diet route is, is to see a dietitian and get the dietitian on board to get in to help you through all this. It can be quite a minefield. Um, but obviously, you know, a healthy diet is something that we should all be striving for, whether we've got fibromyalgia or not. And uh, you know, that certainly would include trying to eat whole foods and, and cutting down on processed food, particularly high sugar and fat foods. But I think that applies to all of us. So that's the, the summary of the ULAR recommendations that you know people should get a diagnosis because if people are having delayed diagnosis, it increases their stress and generally makes things worse. Um, but as, as we mentioned before, it can be quite a hard condition to diagnose. Education, so you know the fact that people are tuning into this is great. Um, comprehensive assessment of pain, function, and psychosocial context. So not just looking at you know the context of what's going on. And the first focus should really be on non-pharmacological modalities. So basically, um, things apart from medication should be really the first focus. That's that's what the guidelines state. So I thought I'd look at some of the other resources out there, you know, which. Um, um, for those of you who are now you, you tuned into the webinar, so I'm guessing that you've all got access to the internet. Um, Health Navigator New Zealand is some, an online resource for people. They have got heaps of stuff on there, um, and it's a really great resource. I would encourage people to get on there. This is a, this is a screenshot I took of their the start of their pain section. So this is a very useful, um, very useful section on, on managing pain. Um, there's something called um, this is something that Auckland University put together for people with um, with health problems and uh, there's a really great website lots and lots of stuff on there um, particularly around managing stress and anxiety and depression and uh, there's some guided meditations on there there's, there's, a, there's a lot of information on there so it's something else you might want to try out have a look at um, then there's a Gupta program some of you may be familiar with this um, Ashok Gupta is a UK doctor who's actually got chronic fatigue syndrome he thinks that um, the fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome and ME are a problem with part of the brain called the amygdala. He thinks that these symptoms are caused by an overactive amygdala, which sensitizes your pain, um, sensitizes you, you know, sensitizes your nervous system and, and, and can create chronic pain issues. And he has a, a Gupta program, which he describes as amygdala retraining. I don't know anybody who's tried this, so, um, but they're interested to get some feedback at anybody who has. Uh, but it is available, and um, but there is a cost to that, obviously, and um, I think it's a set of DVDs you buy. But if you went onto that website, you would see lots of testimonials, testimonials to help them. But that's what you'd expect. Um, you probably are not going to see people's stories where this has not been that helpful. Um, something called Mickle Therapy, which is available in New Zealand. There's a uh, Mickle therapist who will deliver a course of this. This is a similar theory to the Gupta um, program, but, in, but they think it's a different part of your brain, the hypothalamus, which is involved, but similar sort of theory around it. And um, yeah, the Mickle therapists are out there uh, delivering Mickle therapy, which I think is probably cognitive behavior therapy with a few other things thrown in, I think. I don't know anybody who's tried this either, 
uh, but some people might want to try that. Um, and then there's empower therapies out there. This used to, this used to be called the lightning process. Uh, I know one client who phoned me up very excitedly and said he was, his fibromyalgia was cured uh, as a result of this, um, this treatment. So um, yeah, that, that, that's interesting. There's not a lot of evidence to support the use of this either, um, but um, I know people who are persuaded by it. Um, the medical fraternity seem to be split on this. It's, it's, a, it's, um, it's neuro-linguistic programming, that's what this is. And that's, there's not a lot of evidence to support the use of that and you look at the literature, but I do know people who report it's been very helpful. And if you go onto their website, you'll see lots of stories from people who found it helpful as well. One of the orthopedic surgeons down here in Dunedin actually refers his um, patients who surgery are not gonna, it's not gonna help them, um, people with chronic pain, he actually um, refers people on to this program. So that's, that's quite interesting. So you must be persuaded of the benefit of it. Um, and then there are um, there's some support organizations out there. So Fibro Margin News today, it's something that people can subscribe to, um, basically give you all the latest information about Fibro. And um, yeah, and there are apps out there, of course, uh, you know, seems to be apps for everything out there. And uh, people can probably find some apps um, which which may or may not be helpful. Um, the Health Navigator website, which I put up earlier, um, is actually trying to um, have a, a lapse library, an apps library. So um, it will. They hope to be the one the one stop shop for people who want to find out what which apps are helpful for their condition. So I would encourage people to go onto the Health Navigator New Zealand website to see what apps they recommend. Um, because some of these apps are overseas apps and not particularly relevant. If they're talking about medication you can't get in New Zealand, it's not particularly helpful. Um, but there, there are apps out there. Um, so that sort of leads me briefly on to talk about our services, what Arthritis New Zealand can do for people with fibromyalgia. This is a, a list of what we do. We have got our 0800 number, which is, is there at the top of the screen. This is for anybody with, who affect, is affected by arthritis. Um, or fibromyalgia, it's a free call. You can call that number as often as you like, and um, you know, we'll talk to you. It's not manned 24 hours a day because you know, uh, if you call that number at four o'clock in the morning, you'll just be asked to leave your details by an automated message service, and then one of us will call you uh, when we're when we're on duty. So that's how that works. Our arthritis educator service, most that's that's myself and my colleagues. Um, we've all got a health background and um, yeah, hopefully we can talk to you about some things that you might want to try around managing arthritis and fibromyalgia. And this is a free service, so I encourage people to use it. We have got a website, um, there's, the web, there's the address there. We've got a newly diagnosed service as well, so if people with a new diagnosis of some forms of arthritis, then we can sometimes link people up to somebody who's been managing it successfully uh, because that can be very useful. Uh, we have support groups as well dotted around the country. We also have an advocacy service, so we can uh, that can um, uh, causing difficulties with whether it's ACC related or work related or employment or wins related those sort of things. And we have a research fund as well. So we're, when people donate to our organisation, well, some of that money will be uh, reserved for uh, funding research. So uh, that's uh, sort of a brief. Uh, overview of what Arthritis New Zealand is about and what we what we provide. That's our website. That's what it looks like. Um, there's always something saying donate now because we are a charity and we're always very grateful for any any help we can get in that regard. Um, these are some of our information leaflets. Our information leaflets are free, and um, these, this is this is just a small selection of them. But these are the ones that are probably appropriate for people with fibromyalgia. We do have a fibromyalgia leaflet, so on its own. We also have one on managing pain and one on physical activity. So they're all relevant for people with, um, with fibromyalgia. And these are all free as well. Um, so if you wanted those leaflets, you can call us on the 0800 number, which I will put up at the end and um, ask for those leaflets or to talk to one of us. This is our interactive Facebook sessions that we have on, currently having on a Monday evening, but I think we're gonna be changing that to a different day of the week shortly. Uh, but we, on a Monday night from seven till nine, we, we have an interactive session where people can post questions and we will try and answer them in real time. 
Um, and um, so that's something else that a lot of people find very helpful. And there's some bridges being struck up there where people can actually talk to each other about you know, what they found helpful or not helpful and swap their experiences. So that's, that's really great. Uh, so for people with fibromyalgia, it's just a, just a reminder really of, of who can help you. Obviously your GP is your first point of call. Um, if you've got a condition like this, it's really great if you've got a supportive GP because fibromyalgia is a long-term condition and you need somebody who's going to understand the issues around that. Um, so that's going to be a really important relationship to have with your GP. It may be worth a therapist, um, particularly around exercise and massage and acupuncture, those, those sort of things. Your pharmacists are, are great resources out there. They're uh, free. They're, they're health professionals out in your community who you don't have to pay to see. So we would encourage people to make full use of your pharmacists out there. They're not just there to dispense prescriptions. They're people you can ask for, for um, health advice, particularly around medication and supplements. Uh, and their advice is free. So you know, we would encourage people to, to make full use of the pharmacists. Dietitians for people who want to explore any possible options around the diet and nutrition. Pain specialists now, that, uh, I put that there because there are some areas of the country where people can actually ask to be referred to see a pain specialist. Certainly in Dunedin here, we're quite lucky. We do have a pain clinic um, where people can actually uh, be, get referred into the GP and it's in the public system. But I know that um, some areas of the country probably do not have a, uh, a service. Your GP will know. Your GP will know if there's a, a pain service that they can refer you to. Usually there's a, quite a long wait though to see, to see those guys. Um, but I know that they can be very helpful. Clinical psychologists, um, maybe worth asking your GP whether that might be helpful. Um, as I say, some of the some of the techniques we talked about earlier, a clinician would be the most expert. Um, cognitive behaviour therapy, those sort of things, mindfulness techniques. Um, yeah, clinical psychologists can can be very helpful. And um, arthritis New Zealand, just to remind you uh, of, of the um, the the free helpline there. So it's um, 0800 663 463. You can call that from a mobile phone or from a landline in anywhere in New Zealand and the call is free and um, uh, we, we will contact you and have a chat. I mean, we, we're quite fortunate we have got time to talk to you because uh, I know a lot of the time health professionals are under a lot of time pressure so um, we, we usually can find uh, the time to, to, to listen to you and to, to, to try and hopefully give you some advice and information about things you might want to try. Um, so that's what we've looked at, a brief overview of what we looked at. I'm keeping an eye on the time here. I see we've got six minutes left, so um, should be time for questions, I think. So we've had a look at fibromyalgia has on people. Look at the diagnostic criteria and how hard it is to diagnose. A quick look at the ULAR recommendations around some of the treatments, but they were predominantly prescription medicines. Some of the other management options, which some of you guys might want to explore, and an understanding of the support offered by Arthritis New Zealand for people with fibromyalgia. So here are the references. Um, so hopefully if you wanted to have time to look at these references in a bit more, to, a bit more detail, then you can go to the recording and, um, and see them. There's quite a few of them there. And um, if any health practitioners are out there watching this, then we might be able to send you a certificate as well that you've attended the webinar. Uh, if you just let us know. Yeah. Um, so that that's it. Thank you very much. And um, I'll just now go into the the Q and A section. I, I did have one question which was posted before um, before the the webinar, and that was um, uh, someone called uh, from Mar Marcella. So thanks, Marcella, for uh, sending. You um, and she wanted to know what the, the what are the best. Um, that's a very difficult one to answer, really, because um, there are it seems to be an individual thing. Some people find that one form of exercise is really helpful, and yet somebody else with fibromyalgia might find it's too painful. I suppose my short answer um, for exercise is the best form of exercise is the one that you will do. Um, any exercise is better than no exercise. So there may be people say, oh, you, 
get in the pool and do some water-based exercise. But if you don't like the water, you're probably not going to continue to do it. So my advice is to try and find something that's not too painful. Um, and you enjoy, hopefully. And, and if you enjoy it, you're more likely to, to continue to do it. So, um, you know, whether it's water-based exercise or singer physio, um, all of those things can be helpful. But I think the short answer is any exercise is helpful. It's got so many health benefits. If you're able to find some exercise that you're able to tolerate and can do regularly and you enjoy the best exercise for you. Um, so the, I've got another question here. Um, so um, the next question is from um, uh, Diane. Hi, Diane. Uh, this, um, uh, I was um, diagnosed over two years ago with fibro. Um, struggling to find the right, correct pain relief and pain management. Um, what sort of pain medi medication do you recommend to patients beside non, non steroidal anti-inflammatories? Um, so yeah, I mentioned some of those earlier. So um, all kinds of things can help with pain. I think with pain, anything helps. Everything helps somebody with pain. It doesn't matter what it is, even if there's no clinical evidence that it works. Um, there are some people who find that things like homeopathy um, are helpful. Uh, even though there's not really a lot of evidence to support it. So I would not dismiss anything. The problem is that if you tried all the different things out there for pain, you would run out of money pretty quickly. So um, I would say you use the, the health professionals out there, talk to your pharmacist, talk to your physios, talk to your GP, find out you know what they recommend. And you're know, providing something is safe because you know not, not all treatments are, are safe. Providing something is safe uh, or relatively safe, then I would encourage people to try anything, any, anything as far as the pain is concerned. Um, so um, the next question is about, um, I hope, hopefully I've answered that. The next question is about um, someone who's diagnosed, um, any suggestions, oh, sorry, any suggestions for someone who has diagnosed fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis, and osteopro osteoporosis? So somebody's got more than one condition, obviously. Um, so they're asking about um, what they can do. Uh, uh, so the pain is covered, uh, done the pain clinic, CBT and acupuncture. Um, so and it's active, obviously pretty active. So yeah, this is Michelle. Sorry, Michelle, I'm just trying to read your question here. Um, it sounds like you, you've already done quite a lot already, and, um, and I'm glad that you're still active and, and, uh, and, um, and stay, doing exercises, which is great, um, but still sore and, and tired much all, pretty much all the time. So yeah, you, if you've seen the pain clip, you would hope that um, you know, they would have been able to, to try and help you as best they can. What I suggest you do, uh, Michelle, is if you know, rather than have a discussion here, on, on um, is perhaps to give our eight hundred number a ring and talk to one. hopefully your symptoms would be better um lots of things sleep hygiene is what what this is classed as and it's basically um things you can put in place to help you get a, a better night's sleep so things making sure that you are in the right temperature and is free of anything else like any devices like a tv or a a computer or a mobile phone even all those things are, are not there to 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 um because that that can sometimes make sleep really hard um you know to, to try and avoid uh, to do some exercise during the day um to try and avoid caffeine and heavy meals at night all those sort of things you know pretty pretty standard things really but you know uh, making sure that you know, your, your room is quiet if you're living if you're sleeping with somebody who snores and you know you may need to put some that will result in medication to help them sleep. That's probably something that I would say is a last resort. 
But things like using, you know, um, distraction techniques like mindfulness or, um, uh, dis you know, uh, using uh, something like a uh, an audio audios, you know, uh, audio box, those sort of things. They can be helpful to help help people to take the mind off the pain. Um, so there are strategies that people can use to to help to get get a better night's sleep. Um, and as I say, those, those are some simple ones. But sleep hygiene, I, if you if you do Google sleep hygiene, um, then you will find some tips o o online about managing sleep. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm 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 conscious of the time, and I'm just trying to get through any more questions. I can't see any more questions actually um, on my screen at the moment, so that might be it for now. Dave, uh, there's a few inside the chat section. Is that all right? Okay, thank you, Emily. I'm just going to close this box and go to the chat section. Um, um, Emily, I can't see the chat section. I've got a, a, a bar at the top there which um, it's got a QA, but I can't see a. Oh, yeah, I got it. Got it. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm just scrolling down now to see. Oh yeah, quite a few questions actually. <laughs> um, so um, the first one is from Jennifer Pope. Hypnotherapy, hydrotherapy exercise, sorry, have been the most beneficial for me. Um, also, turmeric root, uh, either grated over food or put into smoothie. So that's some great advice from Jennifer, which she, the thing she's found helpful, which is hydrotherapy and um, turmeric, and certainly people with osteoarthritis turmeric is one of the things that people report is helpful or curcumin is the active ingredient in turmeric um, and then um, again from Jennifer we've sh uh, a shout out for um, the Longhurst Physio in Holswell in Christchurch has been very helpful um, so for people in the Christchurch area that might be helpful information the question about does diet and vit vitamin and mineral supplements help with fibromyalgia symptoms um, Diet probably is going to help some people. You know, they may be able to find something that for them um, either triggers fibromyalgia, alleviates it. But as I say, seeing a, fit, seeing a dietitian is probably the best way to go. Susie Jones asking about ozotherapy again. Um, and as I say, I'm not really sure about that one, I'm afraid. Um, and then we've got one about you guys um, getting into our survey monkey. Um, about just providing some feedback to this webinar. Uh, and so yeah, some Jennifer asking about what nights are the, the interactive sessions on Facebook. They are on, at the moment, Jennifer, they are on a Monday night between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. Um, I think in September, we're gonna be changing that to Tuesday night, but that will be signaled on the Facebook page. Um, thank you, Deborah, that's a very kind comment. Um, Jennifer, what nights are, oh yes, that we've got the question already. Um, I think this is just a repeat of this similar question. Um, yeah. So Diane is saying that she lives in uh, Fongaray and found a referral to the pain clinic. Um, want the Fongaray pain clinic, um, very, very beneficial. Uh, saw an occupational therapist and a physio um so i'm just scanning over your answer sorry um yeah i think the, i think the the key message there is to find somebody who really understands your um your you your, your issues that this can cause i know some some clinicians out there can be a little bit dismissive i know that um so probably not that helpful if you can find you know um a, your health pro professionals who are um willing to, to walk alongside you with this condition because it's, it is a long-term condition. You do need to, to um, you know, have, have the right team of people looking after you. Um, Jennifer, talking about, um, yeah, the benefits of turmeric or, or curcumin again. Um, yeah, so that might be something that some of you might want to try curcumin. It's certainly used a lot for osteoarthritis symptoms. Um, there's, there seems to be some clinical evidence that it is helpful for that and it's interesting to find out from you guys that it actually can help with fibromyalgia symptoms as well so um, yeah that's all we'll see um, 
so I would just sort of scan over them very quickly and try and get very quick answers. But as I say, if you if you wanted to talk to one of us in a bit more detail, then please don't hesitate to call our 0800 number. It's 0800 663 463 and um, we we'll be able to spend a bit more time talking to you about some of these issues in, in you know in private and in confidence as well so rather than doing this um, on, a, on a webinar we don't want to be really delving into your personal health information um, yeah. um, somebody else saying that turmeric has not really helped them <laughs> so that's that that's yeah that that's that seems to be the, the case with any treatment really you'll find that some people find it helps them some people find it doesn't and, uh, and you're not really going to know unless you try them, really. So, my advice, if it's pain management, is to you know to, to explore all the options out there if you're able to, and if you can afford them, and if they're safe. But the, the, those are the the uh, things you've got to be aware of. You know, from a safety point of view, do talk to your pharmacist, do talk to your GP, new, and um, particularly if you're already on medication. Um, but you know, if they're happy that it's a safe option, then I would give something a try and and see how how it, how you go. Um, that will be my, my advice, you know, um, whether or not there's any clinical evidence to support the use of it. I can't answer, so um, I might just say thank you, everybody, for for um, for listening. And um, as I say, that this has been recorded, I think, so there might be opportunity for you to watch it again or for other people who haven't been able to join us this time to, to, to catch up on it.